Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to discuss is the dihedral groups. Okay, now the dihedral groups, like the symmetric groups and the cyclic groups that we've discussed in previous videos in this playlist, are a whole class of many different groups, okay, uh, and they are denoted capital D and then subscript little n, where little n can vary over the uh, whole of the natural numbers, basically. And just like with the symmetric groups s little n and cyclic groups c little n, the dihedral group d little n is going to be a group of symbols where the symbols are representing set permutations of a set containing all natural numbers up to and including little n. Okay, so let me write some of this down then. So the names of the dihedral groups uh, are going to be d little n, okay, where little n can be any natural number basically. Okay, so it can be 1, it can be 2, it can be 3, any of those counting numbers that you could use for counting sheep or cows or something along those lines. That's what the natural numbers are, they're the counting numbers. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, the dihedral groups then, like the uh, SN and CN groups, the symmetric and cyclic groups on N elements, uh, they are going to be groups of symbols which are representing set permutations of the set containing all natural numbers up to and including little n. So we'll have the set 1, 2, 3, all the way up to little n, okay? And these groups, these dihedral groups, d little n, they are going to be um, containing elements that are representing set permutations of these sets, basically. Okay, so, uh, we saw when we uh, looked at the symmetric groups, s little n, that the symmetric groups contain absolutely all um, permutations of this set, basically, okay? Uh, so, they will have a symbol representing absolutely every single permutation that exists. We then saw with the cyclic group, c little n, that you only have symbols representing the cyclic permutations of these sets. The dihedral groups, d little n, they are in between the cyclic and symmetric groups. Okay, so let me describe to you how you can create the uh, set permutations uh, which are going to be represented in these dihedral groups, d little n. Okay, so what I'm first about to describe will probably seem very similar to uh, what we did in the case of the cyclic groups, but hold on, it is going to have a difference, basically. Okay, so what you can imagine doing is, once again, creating a disk like so. Okay, but this time, do not nail the disk down to the table, basically. In the case of the cyclic groups, I said, create a disk and then nail it down to the table. In the case of the dihedral groups, we're not going to nail it down to the table. Okay, then what we're going to do is we're going to arrange our n uh, numbers here around the edge of the disk, just like we did in the case of the cyclic groups. Okay, so what we will do is we'll divide 360 degrees up into little n pieces, okay, and we will arrange our little n numbers around the outside of the disk. So we'll start with one up here and we'll go around clockwise. You don't have to do it like that, but it's just a nice simple way of doing it. Okay, so we'll then have two over here, three over here, where these angles between uh, the numbers are going to be 360 divided by n so that they are evenly spaced basically. And then we'll have little n all the way over here. Okay, right, so we put all the elements of our set around the outside, like so. Okay, right. Uh, now, what you're going to do is you're going to do something very similar to what we did in the case of the cyclic groups. You're going to look at all permutations that you can get by rotating this thing around. However, this time, the disk is not nailed to the table. Okay, in the case of the cyclic groups, all I was interested in was the permutations that I could achieve by just rotating the disk in the two-dimensional plane. Okay, it was attached to the desk, and I could not lift it off the desk. This time, I have not nailed it to the desk, and you can this time flip 
the disk over, basically. You can rotate it in three-dimensional space, basically. You can flip it over. That's the key thing that you can now do. Okay, so imagine that these numbers, imagine that they shine through on the other side. So imagine that I've gone over onto the other side of the disk and written the same number in the same position, basically, so that the numbers are on both sides at the same position. So basically, not only can you now rotate in, two -dimensional, in the two-dimensional plane, just like you could in the case of the cyclic groups, but you can also flip the disk over, okay, and um, that gives you more permutations than we had in the case of the cyclic groups, basically. Okay, so these are the permutations that you're allowed to build when you're creating a dihedral group uh, on n elements, basically. Okay, you're allowed not only to rotate it in the two-dimensional plane, but also in the third dimension, basically. Okay, so you're allowed any maneuver that you can make in the real world, basically, in the three-dimensional world. Okay, right. Uh, so, let's discuss why this is actually going to form a group. Okay, uh, so what we want to discuss is why, if we give every one of those permutations that I've just described, the permutations which you can build by rotating the disk and also by flipping the disk, why when you uh, create a set of symbols where you've got a symbol representing every single one of those, does it actually form a group? Okay, right, so let's just make sure that we understand why to base the axioms of group theory. So closure is the first thing. Okay, so we need, uh, basically, um, any two symbols composed together in our group to give another element of the group. Okay, so what does that actually mean? That means that we need any of these uh, permutations that we can build uh, by composing two permutations together uh, of this form to uh, be another one of the permutations that I have represented in my group, basically, in my DN group. Okay, right. Uh, so, hopefully that should be intuitively obvious, because I am creating permutations. The way, the criteria that I have for creating permutations are that you can create a permutation if it's a real-world maneuver, basically. If it's a maneuver that you could actually make in the real world, just by either rotating the disk or flipping it in any way, okay? So if I compose two real-world maneuvers together, I must end up with another real-world maneuver. If I do one thing that I can really do in the real world, and then do another thing that I can do in the real world, I must end up with another permutation that I can make in the real world, okay? Hopefully that's intuitive common sense, basically. Okay, so that's why it achieves closure, because if I represent every single one of these permutations that I can make by moving this around in the real world, okay, um, with a symbol in my group DM, basically, then when I compose any two of those together, I must end up with another one that's represented in my group, basically, just because it must still be a real world maneuver, and therefore uh, it must be represented in that group. So that's why it bays closure, okay? Uh, simply because of the fact that when you compose two real-world maneuvers together, you end up with another real-world maneuver. Okay, right. Uh, so that's why the bays closure. Okay, second axiom of group theory is, of course, associativity, and we know why it obeys associativity, hopefully, by now. Uh, associativity is achieved because of the fact that we are thinking of the elements of the group DN as representing set permutations. Okay, and we are thinking of the composition of elements in DN as representing the composition of the set permutations, and we know as soon as we do that, we get associativity. Okay, so if you're not familiar with that, watch my video on definition of a group, we go into that in a huge amount of detail there. Okay, so that's the crux of what associativity is and where it comes from. It uh, comes from the concept of composing uh, set permutations together. Okay, so because we're thinking in terms of set permutations and the composition of set permutations, that's where we get associativity of the composition law. Okay, we then need an identity element. Well, of course we're going to have an identity element because we will have a symbol in our uh, set DN which is representing uh, the identity permutation, basically. Well, that's just the permutation where you do no rotation at all and all of these numbers are mapped onto themselves, basically. Okay, so there will be a symbol within our uh, group DN which is representing that set permutation where you just map everything onto itself, and then when you 
compose that set permutation with any other set permutation, it will just give that arbitrary other set permutation back again, okay? And that's why this element in our group will compose with any other element to just give that other element back again, okay? So we will have an identity element, okay? Uh, and inverses, finally, finally. Uh, so we need inverses. Okay, right. Uh, so that says that we need to have... Um, for any element in our group, we need to have another element which will compose with it either way round to give the identity back again. Okay, uh, so why do we have that? Well, again, going back to thinking of the elements of the group as representing set permutations of this form, okay, if we have any set permutation that's a real-world maneuver, there will also be the reverse set permutation, the thing that reverses it and takes you back to where uh, the elements were before. Okay, so if you do any maneuver, say you rotate it by a certain amount or you flip it over, there's always an exact opposite maneuver that you can make that returns everything back to where it was originally. Okay, and that's also a real-world maneuver. Okay, so that other inverse real-world maneuver will be represented within our group, basically. It will have a symbol that is representing it in the group, okay? And when I compose uh, my original set permutation with this, uh, uh, well, when I compose the symbol representing my original set permutation with this symbol that represents the inverse set permutation, they will uh, compose together in the group to give me the identity element. So that's why uh, we do indeed have inverses, because the inverse of any set permutation uh, or real-world manoeuvre set permutation that we've got here will also be a real-world manoeuvre and therefore will be represented in here and that's why we have inverses. Okay, right. So, uh, now, before I actually go on to discussing actual examples of dihedral groups, which I hope will illustrate these points more concretely, okay, what I'd like to talk about is what's the size of dm? What is the order of the arbitrary uh, dihedral group on n elements? Okay, how many set permutations of this form actually exist? Well, firstly, we know from our discussion of cyclic groups that the dihedral group on n elements is always going to contain all of those cyclic permutations, and we know how many cyclic permutations that will exist for uh, a set of n elements. Okay, so if we just think about the cyclic permutations, where we're just rotating it in the two-dimensional plane, we're not making any flips, basically. Okay, you can imagine at the moment that it is nailed to the table, and we're only allowed to rotate it in the two-dimensional plane. Okay, uh, then... Uh, as soon as you tell me where 1 goes to, I instantly know where everything else goes to. Okay, so for instance, if you tell me 1 goes to 2, that means that I have rotated it round by this 360 divided by n uh, angle. Okay, so I instantly know where every other element has gone as well. Okay, um, so all you actually have to tell me is which of these n elements 1 goes to, and then I instantly have got the rest of the um, permutation specified, basically. So that means means that there are n different cyclic permutations, okay? Uh, so within our uh, dihedral group on n elements, our dn group, we are going to have those little n cyclic permutations, okay? However, those aren't the only permutations we're going to have, so I've got to put an addition here so that that's not the complete answer yet, okay? But we do indeed have all of those little n cyclic permutations, which will include the identity element, because the identity element is the cyclic permutation where you send 1 to 1, and then everything else will uh, stay the same, okay? It's effectively the rotation by 0 degrees. Okay, right, so now what we need to do is take that um, nail out and now allow ourselves to flip as well as just rotating it in this two-dimensional plane. Okay, so how many flips can we make? The flip permutations, how many of them actually are there? Okay, well, the best way to understand this is to do some examples, and then you'll probably see the pattern. Okay, so let's do a simple example. Let's think about the case where n is equal to 4. Okay, so if we think about the case where n is equal to 4, what I'll do is I'll put uh, 4 um, numbers around the outside, like so. Now, how many flips can I make? Well, that's uh, a question of how many lines of symmetry are there. Okay, so let's just look at the lines of symmetry. So I could flip it down this line of symmetry here that I'm just marking out in green. Okay, that would send 2 to 4 and 4 to 2, and would hold 1 and 3 constant. Okay, I could also 
flip it down this line of symmetry here, which would map 1 onto 3, 3 onto 1, and keep 4 and 2 constant. But there are also two other lines of symmetry here. There's one down here, which would swap 1 and 2 around, and 3 and 4 around. And there's one down here as well, which would swap 1 and 4 around, and 2 and 3 around at the same time. Okay, so in the case of n is equal to 4, there are four lines of symmetry. Okay, you might start to anticipate what the uh, theorem is here. Okay, let's do another example to make that more concrete. Let's do an odd example now. Let's make n is equal to 5, an odd number. Okay, so now let's do 1, and now I have to be careful here to get, to get the angles right. So put 2 there, 3 there, 4 there, and 5 there. Okay, so where are the lines of symmetry in this case? Well, there's a line of symmetry down here, okay, which holds one constant, then swaps 5 and 2 around, and 4 and 3 around. There's a line of symmetry down here, which holds two constants, swaps 1 and 3 around, swaps 5 and 4 around. Okay, there's a line of symmetry down here, which goes through 3, which holds three constants, swaps 2 and 4 around, and swaps 1 and 5 around. There's a line of symmetry down here through 4, which holds 4 constant, uh, swaps 3 and 5 around, and swaps 2 and 1 around, okay? And uh, then there's a line of symmetry down here through 5, which holds 5 constant, and swaps 1 and 4 around, and 2 and 3 around, okay? This extends, okay? Uh, so we can see that there are 5 lines of symmetry in the case of n is equal to 5. Okay, this pattern goes on and on. If you do some more examples, hopefully it will just become intuitive to you that there are always going to be uh, these uh, n lines of symmetry in the case of n, little n is equal to little m, basically. Okay, so basically, there is always a little n flips that you can make, okay? And those now are all of the permutations, so the order of uh, the dihedral group d little n, basically, is equal to 2 at times little n, basically. And you might think, oh, hang on a second, but what about all of the things that we can make from uh, composing two of these uh, permutations together? So what if I, you know, what if I compose a rotation with one of these flips together? Surely I end up with something else. Well, the answer is no, okay? You'll end up with something back in this set, basically. You'll end up with one of these flips or one of these rotations. You will end up with one of these back again when you compose any of those two together. Okay, so these actually are all of the uh, permutations that you can make, all of these real-world maneuvers you can make. And if you still disagree, I challenge you to try and think up new real-world maneuvers that you could make that don't fit into this category of either being a rotation in the plane or just a flip along one of the lines of symmetry of the disk, basically. Okay, you won't be able to find them. Uh, those are all of the real-world manoeuvres, and when you compose any of them, uh, any two of them together, however unintuitive you might find that, it does give one of them back again. Okay, right, so that's the order of the dihedral group on uh, little n elements. Okay, right, so we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video what we'll do is we'll discuss this in more detail by doing some examples. So we'll look at d1, d2, d3, and then the first really interesting one, which is d4. Okay, and that will hopefully give us a better understanding of the dihedral groups.